Great, everybody settle in for the second talk, kind of on decision making, <coughs> with a um, catchy title, Risk and Reward. And um, this will be given by Casey Brown, a good colleague of mine, from way out east, the University of Massachusetts. So take it away, Casey. Great, thanks, Linda. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for coming here today. I have to tell you that for me, it is extremely inspirational to, to see you all here and especially to hear the work that you're all doing. It's really amazing to me um, uh, to have so many people coming from so many different angles attacking the same sort of issues. is just something, honestly, I, I wasn't sure was possible. Uh, and so it's to see you all here in the flesh and blood is really it's an amazing thing, and so really, I want to start off with congratulations to all of you, and good luck uh, with the great work that I think you're going to do. Um, uh, I wanted to start off with a thing about me that is unusual, or or maybe you don't know something like this. Two things I have. Um, the first is that I was in the Air Force, so someone was in the Air Force, maybe. Yep. So I was an Air Force officer, taught at the Air Force Academy, and I don't know if I made uh, civil engineering. There we go. Yeah. Fascinating subject of the Air Force Academy. Some great classes, I'll tell you. Um, a little dull, actually, a little dull. <laughs> um, and I don't know if I made this up, but I, I think we used to go around saying that flexibility is the key to air power. Did we say we said that, didn't we? Yeah. So, so it was great. Still, I use that my whole life now. It's good Air Force training. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing is that uh, I'm in denial about this, but a week from tomorrow, I'm going to move to France for a year. Um, for a sabbatical. I know, even Linda doesn't know. I, I'm in such denial that even Linda doesn't know. Um, but what really got me, it, it just got me... Where in France? Um, Grenoble. It was picked solely for the skiing and hiking, I have to say. Um, I, I, I know it's a wonderful place, but that was the reason. Um, but it struck me as I was coming out here yesterday, I just it, for the first time it hit me that I'm going to miss my dog. I'm leaving my dog behind for a year. Isn't that tough? And that dog drives me crazy. And yeah, I'm going to miss my dog. More about my dog to come. Um, <laughs> so today's talk is risk and reward. And, and I know everyone's talking about uncertainty. And it's been wonderful to see different definitions of uncertainty already so far. And I'm going to try to uh, give you a very clear definition. I'm an engineer, so I come at things from an engineering perspective with all the negative associations that that implies. Um, and an engineer who, who takes who is uh, really trained in water resources systems analysis, so I'm going to talk a lot about water issues from a systems analytical perspective. And really, you can sort of think of this as my adventures with hydrologic risk. And it's uh, trying to be not very theoretical, but very practical in terms of the problems I've faced and, and how we've tried to address them. Maybe in some cases, we've um, we've made a difference. And I, here's the only theoretical thing. So um, my theory on things is that it is uh, a crazy, chaotic world, and we cannot anticipate the future. Um, for someone who cares very much about what I would call, in a very broad way, water sustainability, um, my hope is that we can make a difference one decision at a time, that if we make every decision we face just slightly better, then maybe we'll muddle through to a better place. I don't have any high hopes, but just a nudge here and there is, is sort of the goal for my work. And I think that that's um, it's what motivates me, and hopefully uh, you'll see some progress in that direction in the slides that I give today. So um, uncertainty, I'm going to define it as risk and opportunity, some combination of those. And so risk as an expected value. This is how I would like to define risk. And what I mean by that is the product of the consequences of a hazard and the probability that the hazard will occur. So um, how many people have seen this as your risk definition before? This is an OK definition? OK, good, good, good. So we're, we're right there. So risk can be interpreted in, the, in these terms as an expected loss. So an expected value. So for example, a risk of flood damage times the probability of a flood is a classic sort of a definition there. And we can give it, and typically we do in engineering terms, monetary value. 
In some fields, risk is interpreted or defined as the probability of a negative event. And so you might see, for example, risk of being hit by an asteroid. I don't know that that's the real risk. Um, but, uh, but I think it's still consistent with being an expected value, which is a binary uh, consequence. Either you get hit or you don't get hit, and, and it reduces to the probability of being hit. So in general, I think we can think of, and I like to think of risk as an expected value. What about opportunity? Well, we hate to focus just on the negative. And so if we think of all the things that can occur in whatever it is that is uncertain that we're concerned with, uh, there is, can be upsides as well. And so we want to ensure when we focus on risk, and it's important to focus on risk, that there's two particularly important links to the upside. And one is just to recognize that uncertainty also presents opportunities. Uh, and we want to be open to recognizing those opportunities and not just focusing on uh, the downside of uncertainty. In addition to that, one often finds if we don't adequately address risk, if we don't ad adequately address the downside, it can be very difficult to take advantage of opportunities. So these things are, are connected in at least two important ways. So uh, when I think of uh, uncertainty, I like to think of risk and opportunity. Um, and this is a cartoonish probability distribution function, density function. I know you have, I think, more in-depth discussions of probabilities coming up, so I won't go far there. But we can think of the downside to the left and the upside to the right, so different aspects of uh, uncertainty. Important parts of our uncertainty that can really help us uh, frame our decisions. OK, more names. So these are some more names uh, that I like to give to uncertainty. These really aren't my names. But um, we start off with the unk unk, which is made by this creature, uh, pot belly pig. Does anybody know what an unk unk is? Yes, students, yes. An unknown unknown. That's exactly right. So an unknown unknown. Now, the unknown unknowns are the most frustrating thing to me because Let's someone give an example of an unknown unknown. <laughs> as soon as you do, it's a known unknown. It's a frustrating thing. So it's an unknown unknown related, I'll say related, um, are what are called surprises uh, or uh, so high impact, low probability events. But if I say low probability, then I'm already saying that I can assign probabilities to them. Um, or some relative probability. Black swans, anybody know what a black swan is? That's a black swan right there. Black swan, anyone? Yes, yes? That's right. You should have seen it coming is sort of the argument. And it has high impact as well. So it seemed to leave writes a nice book about the, the back black swans is the idea that people could not conceive that there could be black swans, right? Because they've only ever seen white swans. And it turns out if you look around the world long enough, you find some black swans out there. And when you really think about it, what would prevent a swan from being, being black? It turns out nothing. So we should have known there are black swans. Uh, a conk, conk, you can guess. A conk is a known unknown. That's very right. So this is where we like to live, because if it's a known unknown, we can quantify or at least attempt in some way to address our uncertainty. Uh, so we like known unknowns. And finally, there's a skunk. Anybody know what a skunk is? It's a known that stinks. <laughs> You've seen them. They look like that. No, it's real. OK, thank you very much. Um, so <laughs> just some terms. This is uh, 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 the way I like to think about mostly kunks and skunks. And then in my spare time, when I'm stuck in an airplane, I think about unkunks. And they become kunks. Um, OK, so what are some of the uh, known unknowns that we deal with? Some of the kunks. In the water resources sector, it starts, this is the typical sort of a process for analyzing our risks in the water resources sector, right? And so it's a wonderful process. We start with mission scenarios. We drive general circulation uh, models with those. We correct those in some way through uh, observations to get downscale DCM or downscale data, we run that through a hydrologic model, we run that through a water resources systems model, 
And then finally, we can say something about how our system will perform under future climate scenarios. How many people have done that process? All right, yes, we have some, exam some experience with that. Great. So um, as you might imagine, if you are a water manager and you're only interested in that la last box right there, that can seem like a long process with lots of moving parts um, to get the answer that you want. And one can imagine that maybe at the, when you're at the end of that, uh, you might have some questions about what those answers really mean. And in addition to that, um, you might have already run out of time or money in your study, which actually happens sometimes. And so you get, it turns out, you don't get to talk about the things maybe you're most interested in the water manager until the first three and a half years of your study is done. And so this is a problem that we ran in quite a bit. And so we tried to think, is there a way in which we can start with the first, that last part of this process, which the water managers seem to be most interested in, and try to work in reverse to have some sense of how we can use this information to be responsive to the concerns that the water managers will have. Um, and so the idea is, so the problem as we saw it, so it was thinking about new ways to frame our decisions for climate change. And the general question that we're interested in, I think maybe everyone's interested, of course, and I don't mean this in any sort of policy way, um, but just our own engineering way of getting at things, is that the usual mode of engagement, the way we're sort of trained to think about this, is what would be called prediction-centric where we engage with science in order to reduce the uncertainty affecting the decision. And so science can tell us the most likely future condition is A, and then uh, uh, the decision maker can say, okay, well, under future A, option one is my best choice. So this is great. You told me how the future is going to work out. Bounded in some way, I'll make a good choice for that future. Um, what we see a lot, certainly in the water side of things, is uh, a different mode of engagement where we engage with science to reduce uncertainty or to better yet characterize uncertainty in some way. And when we do that, we find that the uncertainty may actually increase. So the science side of things says, here's a wide range of possible futures and we're not sure they delimit the, f the full range and we're not sure, or the true range, I'm sorry, and we're not sure really how to assign probabilities to that range. And the decision maker says, hmm, okay, what do we do now? Uh, so this is, uh, has anyone seen this sort of graph before? This is sort of a the hazy, the hazy future graph. Right, so this is sort of the murky future. And as a scientist, we want to reduce the uncertainty of this picture, right? So what do we do? Well, we increase, res increase resolution, potentially. So let me try that. Oh, no, that was a different process. Yeah. There, that's increasing resolution. That is a crazy statistical technique to get more signal from the noise. Uh, but sometimes if we step back, oh, sorry, let me try that again. Yes, here we go. If we just step back a bit, ah, it was just a dog. There's nothing to be afraid of there. That's Pancake. That's the dog I'm going to leave behind for a year. Isn't that, that's hard. So I had to put her in the uh, presentation. OK, so the point here is that if you step back a bit, sometimes the picture becomes clear. That's the whole point. And I think in particular, what we find, or at least what we try to find, sorry, is that decisions, when we frame things in terms of decisions, clear decisions, and, and decisions uh, can be a way of describing risk as well, when we step back, we can use the decision as a, a cleaver almost through the uncertainty. Instead of trying to be very careful and very very carefully and precisely characterizing the uncertainty of the future, we find that a decision can make the stakes much less in some cases in terms of how precise those, uh, that uncertainty characterization needs to be. In some cases, cases, the decision makes things very clear. That's our general hope. So we've, uh, uh, I've got Rob's name up here. I hope he doesn't mind. He was willing to be co-author in this paper. We described this process where we um, propose an alternative to the usual traditional, I think is too strong a word, but a common approach uh, to, to doing impact analysis where we start with projections. I just want to offer an alternative that one need not uh, start with the projections. One can start with defining how our system performs and where is it vulnerable. 
that involves some careful thinking about how we do that explore, exploration. We've done some thinking there, and I think there's a lot more that can be done to improve how we do that, certainly. Once we uh, do that sort of expo exploration, we can determine, for example, the climate changes that cause us problems and th that are problematic to us, and we can de determine the climate changes that we need not worry about. Once we do that, we can, in a, in a way that is described as ex post scenario analysis, define scenarios, and then we can turn to the climate science and tell us something about those future conditions that are problematic, for example. What can we learn about them? Can we diagnose the mechanisms? Can we then look at the credibility of the uh, reproduction of the mechanisms and the simulations that we might use? The hope is that by using this decision as a starting point, using the vulnerabilities of the system as a starting point, it can help us tailor our analysis to the things that are really relevant to the decision we're trying to address. OK, so here's the summary of my talk. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I have a few more slides, but I figure I'd give it now in case you fade off. Um, we have to live with uncertainty. There are inherent irreducible uncertainties of the climate system, and this requires a shift of emphasis from reduced uncertainty to risk reduction. I'm speaking largely in terms of the water sector, where, which is where I work, but there are some general aspects of this. Um, I think in some cases we find that decision-based approaches allow specification of the information that is actually needed, and in some cases it may be less than you think, uh, which is a nice to learn. Uh, GCMs, general circulation models, provide information that can be useful for managing risks when treated appropriately. I think we, um, we know of cases where uh, maybe the information is used in ways where some of, none of us in this room would really think it was the right way to do it, but certainly it is used in those ways sometimes. Um, but that doesn't mean it can't be used in ways that can help us. And finally, when using climate or uncertain information, whether it's climate change or seasonal forecasts, which is another area I work in, it's important to manage we think of what we think of as the residual risk. So we make a particular decision. We think this is the best decision. But what are the risks that, are, that that decision entails? What are the things that we, we know we're exposing ourselves to? And are there ways that we can manage that residual risk, the risk that isn't addressed by the decision that we make? I'll try to illustrate these in a few examples. First, I'm going to take a step totally uh, in a different direction. And I wanted to link to some of the other work that I've done. These are, again, sort of my adventures with hydrologic risk and a motivation for some of this work. And it goes back to this interesting discussion of the geographic effect. Has anyone heard about the geographic effect on economic development? Let's hear it. Let's hear something about it. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. That's good, yeah. Did you want to weigh in that as well? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so it's, 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 anyways, it's a lovely debate. I like it a lot. Um, interesting thing. So uh, just to summarize very shortly, graphics such as this is from Jeff Sachs saying that, look, uh, geography matters. And he has a number of different ways that he uh, quantifies geography, such as whether your country is landlocked or not, uh, coastline, distance from the equator, temperature, all sorts of things like this, shows through uh, statistical regressions that there's a, an association with reduced uh, economic growth or per capita GDP, for example. So these are interesting sort of cases. And then others say, no, it's all about institutions. New regressions, look, it's all about institutions. Then others say, well, it's the um, climate that affects the institutions that then explains this, and that's why the associates. Anyways, fascinating. Um, so, you know, I was young, uh, I needed the money. Why not look at this, right? So I'm an engineer, pretending as engineers pretend to do, uh, get into policy and economic things. Civil engineers, especially. Any civ civil engineers in the audience? No civil engineers. No. Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, very good. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, that's right. So 
That's right. So we pr pretend to be other fields. Um, and this is one of the ones we work on. So uh, what we did here is we looked at, so we're interested in the geographic effect, right? And when you, you look at it, so what really jumps out, at least to me, was how coarse the metrics they use of this geographic factor is. And when you look at this sort of a thing, they think largely of temperature. Um, they did look at mean annual precipitation. What, but I was at the time working at an ENSO oriented place. It was all about interannual variability. I think this is an inter interannual variability map, if you ask me, of precipitation. And so we were able to create something like this that um, shows a similar sort of a me message. So you, if you look at uh, two different ways of measuring variability, mean annual rainfall and monthly rainfall variability, and then you plot the nations of the world on these two axes, and then you use the per capita GDP of each of those nations to size the bubble. And then you color the bubble according to whether, sorry, yes, just one more axis here, the interannual inter variability is high or low. You do all of those things. What do you find? You find this, that the wealthy nations share a small window of favorable climates, uh, low variability and moderate rainfall. I don't know if I have it up here, but there's, you can see all these other little, little bubbles. Generally, they, things tend to be harder up there in terms of variability. Now, we did not want to get involved in this question of uh, causation and environmental determinism or anything like that. We're just interested, what are the stakes right now? Because if we look around the world, our feeling was that uh, many of the countries in the world are more exposed to risk than we are in the United States, for example. And we're trying to dig into wh what is the right way to reduce that risk, this concept of water security, which uh, is in the paper that I um, made available for you all. And how do you get there? Is it inf infrastructure? Is it institutions? Is it an active area for research? But we just wanted to show that there is a difference, that the variability faced in some countries is greater and that there is an economic consequence to that variability. So in a series of papers, we so these sorts of papers are frowned upon, I have to say, um, where co cross-country analyses, uh, no real control for um, the institutions, for example, that a country might have. So we went a little further and did these fixed effects regressions. Let me just say this, is that in these analyses, we find that this drought effect in particular is associated with slower economic growth. So, uh, and the question is then how do we, do we address it? Is it through infrastructure? Is it through institutions? I'm not sure, but we want to make sure that we understand that the stakes associated with hydrologic risk with variability are very high. And so we don't want to focus solely on climate change in the distant future. In much of the world, the worst consequences of climate change that we envision for, say, the US in the future are happening right now. And that's the point of these particular stories. And one in particular is this idea of poverty traps, where instead of the right-hand arm of the probability density function being associated with opportunity, it's associated with forfeited opportunity because you're not able to take advantage of those uh, opportunities because you're constantly focused in trying to mitigate against the downside risk. And when there are no safety nets, um, in a particular location, it can be very hard to take advantage of the opportunities. Yes. Yep. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. 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 We have a new version that is river basin by river basin. Believe it or not. Yeah. I'll be happy to share that as soon as we uh, get it to work. Um, <laughs> OK, so now this is my cartoon. If we take this is a uh, per capita GDP from a country in West Africa. And, just, and so this is the other thing I do in my spare time on long flights. I look at the trajectories of countries of the world over time in per capita GDP, because it, just to look at them is fairly shocking, in the sense that we're, I'm just so used to them going up. It's a big deal in this country if we have negative economic growth, if we have a recession. This is a big, big deal. If you look at the GDP per capita trajectories of countries of the world, you realize it's not such an exceptional thing to have a country have negative growth in a particular year. Um, what we envision is there a way in which we can reduce this drought effect. And it's a small actual uh, reduction changes a stagnant uh, trajectory into a growth trajectory. This is uh, our motivation to some extent in terms of how can we 
get at this risk that countries face and the impacts that they have. And it's not, I think, a distant question of, of how are we going to address these coming uh, disasters, but it's for many countries in the world a problem right now. And it's not a theoretical exercise. Yes, yeah. Yeah. So yes, that's a good question. In this graph, what we did is, um, in the previous slide, I just went through quickly, we found that 10% increase in drought area causes a 40% reduction in annual growth in Sub-Saharan Africa. So it was, a, it was an analysis just for countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. So then we withdrew in the years here where there were droughts, we used that factor to reduce the drought effect. And it was just, I mean, it, it was very much a cartoonish sort of exercise, but it was surprising to me that just a small reduction in a few years changes the trajectory from one of stagnation to one of growth. That's all. Very cartoonish way. Okay, so more adventures, uh, and in particular, I'd like to look at flood risk management right now. This is a flood control storage structure from Western Massachusetts, and this is happiness to uh, a flood engineer. This is the happiest state of the world right there. Anybody know why this is the happiest state of the world? It's empty, that's right. It's ready to catch floods. That's a dry, we're often used to seeing dams that have reservoirs behind them, water. This is a dry bed reservoir. They're empty, they're just waiting to catch floods. This one's ready to go. Um, it's never spilled. This is Coralville Reservoir in uh, Iowa, an Iowa River. This is the worst state of the world for a flood engineer because now it's overflowing and they've lost all control. They have no control at this point. Whatever comes in goes out. So this is downstream trouble. And poor Coralville Reservoir has had an increase in what are called spill events. So it's had spill events in the last 20 years. It's had two just recently, last week or so. They were worried about a third. Um, and this is a challenge. Uh, how do we how do we address this question of is this increasing flood risk or not? So in order to talk about that, I want to give you a short history in flood risk estimation and the concept of non-stationarity. Um, as you may have heard, how many people have heard this concept, this statement that uh, stationary is dead? People have heard that? Excellent. Very good. So before we bury it, I, I don't think stationary is dead, just a record. I think stationary is the undead. It will not die. It's the zombie assumption, uh, useful, still walking. I see it all the time. It's walking around. It's living. Um, anyway, so the idea is that traditional approaches to water resources management in general and, and flood risk estimation are based on stationarity, that we can use the his, uh, historical statistics, that they are unchanging, and so they are useful estimation of the risk that we'll see in the future. The past represents the future. We can do things such as synthetic stream flows, where we use those statistics to generate many, many time series that are consistent with the statistics, estimate risk in a more robust way. Critical period analysis, we look at something like the worst drought on record, uh, uh, the worst flow on record, and make sure that our uh, system can handle that. And, and we do some interesting things such as providing fixed water allocation when we're divvying up water among states, let's say. Um, and yes, so that this was uh, really um, prevalent, I would say, to the early 70s. Increasingly, it was called into question. It wasn't just uh, in 2008 when this paper came out. Um, one of the first sort of shots across the bow was the recognition of temporal structure in the hydrologic record. In other words, not every year was the same. We could, there was structure to it. We could understand that some years are different than un other years. Why are they different? In, uh, uh, why are some years different? Well, there are things such as the El Nino Southern Oscillation that make flood risks in some parts of the world higher in some years than others, and drought risks in some parts of the world higher than others. So there's structure there. Not every year is the same. Uh, Pacific Tejero Oscillation, another example of that. And we have extended departures from the long-term mean. We look at lots of records. It's not this nice uh, um, sort of... Uh, um, random walk around the mean, but we have these long-term departures, these persistence that are very difficult or were very difficult to reproduce in our typical statistical models. Um, and so this, this um, led to an emphasis on monitoring, forecasting, and early warning systems. Probably all still a very good idea. I worked at a, a climate center that focused on trying to develop long-term uh, warnings, uh, ENSO-based forecasts. Turns out it's hard to uh, 
forecast. And so on a long-term basis, it's even harder to make the, those forecasts useful in some way for decision makers. Um, and then finally, we have the recognition of climate change and non-stationarity. Now, the, uh, the Milley paper is quite famous, Death of Stationary 2008, I believe, but Viet Klemsch uh, stated in 1974, I like this paper and I like this quote, by assuming non-stationary, we acknowledge the non-existence of preset limits and directions, unpredictability, and we subscribe to a philosophical indeterminism. And he was arguing at the time that we, we know there are problems with the stationarity assumption. Um, we still use it, but should we still use it? This was his uh, point back in 1974. Sometimes you're going too early uh, with your good idea, as it turns out. Um, so now we are emphasize diagnosing change and its implications, uh, growing recognition of our limited ability to predict the future. And the big question is, are our risk management strategies resilient to this uncertain future? This is the world we live in right now. Um, so here's the classic approach. I take, uh, so this is for flood risk estimation on the y-axis, we have our flood flow. And on the x-axis here, I have exceedance probability. If you read across the top, I take my peak, fl uh, peak flow from each year in uh, an annual time series, so it's extreme value time series and I can order them in terms of their magnitude. I can fit them to a distribution, such as the log normal Pearson type 3, which is what the US Army Corps of Engineers uses. And then I can pick off for a particular flow value, such as the 100-year flood uh, particular, uh, or design value. I can uh, calculate the flow associated with that. You can see a few problems. Let's look back at this, what this looks like. Not a whole lot of data points up there. Um, a lot of extrapolation. Interesting thing that they deal with, which is problematic, is these low values. These low outliers tend to be a problematic aspect of flood risk estimation. You wouldn't believe it, but the number of small guys down here has a big impact on where this line is up here. Small changes down here, big changes in what that uh, value actually is. <clears throat> okay. So this is historically how we've done it. So this is the, the Iowa River, the example I was just telling you about. Um, where they have, have had these recent events, uh, and the question is, are flood risks increasing? And what can we do about it? So there is a sort of a cartoon of the area. We have Coralville Lake and the reservoir, which protects Iowa City. And there's discussions of whether we should build levees. We were sort of interested in whether we could flood the farmers downstream instead for a price, and whether we could change the, reservation, uh, the reservoir operations. Would that be enough? So the question is, these flood trends, can we believe them? This is a paper by Rich Vogel. He finds flood trends all over the place, it did a national analysis, and you can see um, these trends. Can you see them? He swears they're there, and look, he's got the significance levels to prove it. Um, but at this, question, at this point, we have to ask, what does statistical significance really mean to us in comparison to, say, economic significance and, and decision significance? But the trends are there. Um, is the trend there in our case? Well, um, it's on edge if we do a typical sort of test. But does that really matter? We're really interested in what we're going to see in the future. That's what's happening in the past. Um, and so we used an approach to try to quantify all the uncertainties in an integrated way. I've heard that somewhere before. And including the hydrologic modeling uncertainty in the uh, internal variability, so the um, natural variability, one might say. And if we do that, here is our, and we talk in terms of expected annual damages, which is, we think, more relevant than statistical significance. Um, we get a strange looking envelope like this. Why is it so strange? Because we're punting on what the mean future climate change will be. We say we don't know what the mean future climate change will be. Uh, so let's just try a bunch of possible mean future climate changes. And we can combine that with the um, internal variability and the hydrologic modeling uncertainty just to get a sense of what that uncertainty range is. If we want to, on the same axis, we can always plot uh, projections of mean precipitation as well and really bring it together to a large uh, distribution of uncertainty. So if we look at the historical case, our typical uh, means of estimating risks, then we might have something like this and we build our levee as so up to the 100-year flood. This is, if you can't tell, a cartoon. 
Uh, and so then if we wanted to, maybe if we're, we're feeling a little flush, we could build a um, factor of safety on top of that, right up to the 95th confidence interval on that 100-year uh, flood estimation. If we try to bring in some of these other uncertainties to address the future that we might see, and, and I'm, again, just sort of adding these in a, in a cartoonish way, the point here is that even if the mean climate doesn't change, the uncertainty widens, then the implications are, in a very one-sided sort of way, problematic from a risk perspective. Because if we think we're building here and we're addressing all our uncertainties, the uncertainties are quite large. Yes, the mean doesn't change, so maybe there's trend or there's no trend. Greater uncertainty means greater risk, even the, if the uncertainty doesn't change. Okay, but the final question, and, and linking a little bit to the earlier talk, is the physical uncertainty maybe the easy part of this sort of a calculation? And in, in our usual uh, modeling flow here, we start with our peak flow uh, exceedance probability estimation. We run that through a damage function to put things in terms of economic consequences. And then we can devise some optimal flood risk reduction plan. And, uh, and that sounds great. But then somehow we have to turn that into an actual decision that the people, for example, in Iowa City make. How do we go through that process? This is this great challenge associated with non-stationarity. This we might call the wicked. Uh, who's heard the, the term the wicked before? Yeah, so the wicked problems, right? And wicked problems are, um, they have various attributes. One of my favorite attributes of wicked problems is that the problem, any problem you can actually see is a symptom of another problem. And isn't this the case in flood risk management? Because as soon as we start to have these conversations, someone is certainly going to come up to me and say, well, the real problem here is the flood insurance program. And I say, well, yeah, that's probably right. And let's go down the road of trying to fix the flood insurance program. And it can go on and on and on. Um, another, so this is a nice paper. And I take this paper, uh, if those of you who haven't read it, and, and I'll try to make it available. Um, if there's interest in it, it's, it seems to be a little pessimistic in, in this very thing that we're setting out to do. Now, it's an old paper, but it, it really um, takes a critical look at this idea that we can use our, our modeling approaches in these policy uh, sorts of questions. And I think that that's, and it raises great questions, so we should be aware of those questions. At the same time, I think we can see it as a challenge, that that's right, that these are very, very difficult um, questions to try to answer, but what's the alternative? Why wouldn't we try to address them and try to nudge people towards better decisions? I have a friend I work with quite a bit who works in South Asia for the World Bank, and he talks about his goal in life is to have people do database analysis, move them towards database analysis and analysis-based decision-making, because they don't right now. That's just the goal. It almost doesn't matter what answer they finally get. He just wants analysis to be database and the decisions to be, uh, I'm sorry, da analysis to be database and the decisions to be analysis based. And I think that to some extent, maybe that's a good way to look at it, that if at least we're doing the analysis, we may not always get the decision that we want, but at least in some way we're in the game, we're at least in the game. I think that's a positive thing. And in relation to being in the game, there's a quote within that paper, every profession is a conspiracy against the laity. What do you think that means? Come on, someone has an idea. Yeah. And that's right. Um, or at least that's certainly one good interpretation of it. Um, I mean, it's sort of shocking. This is 1973, and they're talking about how people don't trust experts anymore. Wow, did they know what they were getting into uh, on that? I think it's another, I like to think of it also a little bit from a humble perspective and from trying to think about how we do interdisciplinary work is that it applies to us as well. In other words, within our own field, whether it's the flood risk estimation or whether it's climate science, um, those on the outside can see you, us, as a conspiracy and against the laity. And, and we use our own language. We use our, uh, our jargon that's difficult for others to, to, to access. And sometimes we use it as a protection. Uh, to, to avoid the challenging questions. So I just also try to think of it as a reminder to, to not try to, uh, to let myself uh, 
to not hide behind sort of the, the, the tools we can hide behind. Question, yeah. Yes, yeah, so what do you mean? Yep, go ahead with that. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. I think, uh, uh, you know, I think I like the phrase because we can interpret it in many ways. And in every way, I think, helps us to remember to be sort of humble about how we do, how we do our work. Yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah. But it's also important to uh, look at the downstream impacts of the embankment itself and the uncertainty associated with the intervention itself, right? And how, how can we factor that part of it? Yeah, it's a good question. In this in this example um, here, going back to the Coralville case, yeah, we're just starting to get into that. That's exactly right. It's because we're trying to, if we're going to really do a good comparison of letting the farmers, fee uh, farmers fields downstreams flood to levees, we have to have uh, a very complicated understanding or, or challenging understanding to get of how the levees could affect the flows downstream and how, they, how the flows will propagate. Flows that we haven't typically seen before will propagate downstream. You know, in that case, we're turning to more models. Uh, HEC-RAS models to turn flows into stages and, and, and inundation areas. And um, I think the uncertainties will widen. Yeah, I don't have a good good way to address that uh, other, other than our typical, wire, it'll be wider bands, I think, in that case. That's right. I mean, that doesn't mean, I think we have to be very, we have to do our best to characterize those uncertainties and then carry them through the analysis. It doesn't mean it's going to be, uh, prevents an answer, it's certainly not uh, something that we can point out as one option being better than another, but you're right, we need to make sure we try to, to retain those uncertainties in the modeling chain. Good, okay, so uh, let me keep moving here. So let's talk about this idea of um, valuing alternatives. Typically, what we use is benefit cost analysis and benefits associated with reduction in risk for any uh, particular alternative. Avoided expected losses, and this can be due to a change in the probability or uh, in the consequences associated with a particular event. And again, this is an expected value. So we are uh, faced with this problem of, an, of the probabilities that we're going to assign to these flows in the future and how is the best uh, way to do that. A particular challenge in the benefits associated with risk reduction is risk is not an observable quantity. So uh, we are constantly dependent on these sorts of calculations and what we read about in the news often are consequences, right? So this is what we can observe, consequences. We can't actually uh, observe risk. This is a challenge. Nobody writes newspaper articles about the flood that was caught in the dam or that was flooded wetlands and downstream there are no impacts. Nobody writes those sorts of articles. Um, the costs are just the typical costs associated with reducing risks, and in some cases, especially that we work with, and maybe some that you work with as well, they're not strictly uh, financial costs, they can be eco uh, ecological costs as well. And then our typical decision approach is to find the alternative that yields the maximum benefit cost ratio. The challenge is that these benefits in particular are dependent on our, our estimation of the probabilities of the future floods, and we don't know how to do that very well. Um, here's, uh, I won't talk too much about this, but so here's a typical decision model we might use to do that. Uh, optimal flood risk management, a paper that Jay Lund wrote, just a typical example, where we can minimize our risk, which is uh, we can have permanent measures times the cost of those permanent measures, and option measures, things we only do when we need them, times the cost of those, and the damages. And these need to be weighted by the future floods that may or may not occur. So with all this in there, there are many uncertainties. Um, the probability of a given flood stage is just one of them. We need to be cognizant of that. But it's one that we can at least address and try to look at so the implications of it. And um, we've tried to do that in the case looking at the water supply and flood risk, res flood risk reduction reservoir serving water to the Fort Hood as part of a, don't ask, part of a military installation uh, climate risk assessment. Um, 
But here's a more typical case of what a reservoir does. Uh, typically, multi-objective reservoirs trying to accomplish more than one goal, and they'll have a flood control pool, which is typically empty, and then they'll have an active storage pool where they save water from the wetter periods and provide it in the drier periods. So this is general idea of flood risk reduction. <clears throat> we were interested in looking at how this particular reservoir could manage the uncertainty with climate change. Can they handle a change in the frequency of floods, for example, in the future? So how do we do this? We say, we have no idea what the future holds. It could get wetter, it could get drier, it could get warmer, I guess it could get cooler. Um, actually, we have a case where someone, where we've been told we must uh, assess scenarios where it is cooler in the future, so we do that, we do that. Um, and so an important part of what we do is try, is what we call this climate stress test, where we develop these scenarios that are consistent uh, with historical variability that we've seen. Uh, we make sure that we preserve spatial correlations, for example, and, and the historical statistics. We can also turn the knob on those historical statistics, make variability greater in different ways if we're interested in that. We just explore all the possible changes, or at least a wide range of possible changes, without saying anything about whether they're likely to occur or not. All we want to know is where our system is going to break. Where, what can this particular water supply and flood risk reduction handle, and what can it not handle? We're interested in, in particular in what it can't handle, because then we'll say this is the climate change we have to be worried about. So this is what you get so once you do that. Uh, um, I'll show you here. This is a precipitation change in the x-axis. And we're putting this in terms of temperature. Sometimes we do it in terms of variability. Uh, temperature change in the y-axis. This is the current system. In the blue area is where the system can provide acceptable performance. So we've put in thresholds on performance. And above, when the system performance is above those thresholds, we call it acceptable, with the idea of it being uh, robust and a satisfying sort of approach. And so we can see that the current system can handle uh, precipitation reductions down to about 95% of the long-term average, and increases of about 120% or so. If it gets wetter than that, then we can no longer provide acceptable flood, reduction, flood risk reduction. And if it gets drier than that, we can't provide acceptable water supply. So these are the climate changes that we can handle, and these are the climate changes that we cannot handle. But we're looking at adaptations in particular. What if you were to adjust the amount of reservoir space you held to catch floods, or the amount of reservoir space that you held to provide water during droughts, for example? If we um, develop different sorts of plans, for example, here's alternative one, where we have allocated more water for uh, providing water during drought, more space, we can see that we can handle a greater climate change now. Now again, we're not saying anything about what's likely or not, we're just learning that our system can handle a little bit more climate change with a small adjustment. We make another adjustment. Uh, this is more water allocated to supply instead of flood risk reduction. We've exposed ourselves to more risk on the high side. We can handle more on the low side. If we put all these together, this is a terrible color scheme, but we can see where we're at risk and where our E relatively easy adaptations can handle the changes that are that may be ahead of us. And so, for example, these are uh, the, the areas where there's no plan. These are the changes we can't handle. So if it happens, and the, you can see they're pretty dire changes, a 70% reduction in precipitation and a 4 degree warming, we cannot handle that. It's going to impose droughts upon us that our system cannot handle. On the high side, if it gets too wet, then there's going to be floods that we cannot handle. So we haven't said anything about how to assign probability to the space. And I think it's an interesting question that we're currently exploring. But we can quickly see what our system can handle and what it can't handle. And what we're interested in is the probability of those particular changes. Those are the ones we have to worry about. Maybe assessing whether that's high or low to these spaces is an easier job than assigning probabilities to the entire space in, in, a, in a very precise sort of way. Okay. I want to stop here. This is sort of my no or no-go points, because flexibility is the key to air power. Um, and so let me stop here and take questions. We have half an hour left, I think, and so I'm happy to um, answer any questions that people have about any of this. Yep. OK, yeah, sure. Yep. The previous uh, picture, so how confident are you with 
this? Is there, a, is there an uncertainty in this? Like, I mean, you're sure that if precipitation is between 95 and 120, you can handle it? Yeah, it's a good question. It's, it's a very good question because what is hidden in each one of these is one more threshold on acceptability. So each one of these squares for a mean climate, we also want to make sure that we assess performance over the variability that would be natural variability associated with each one of these climate changes. So each one of these circles has about, on the or depending on what uh, version this is, maybe a thousand runs, maybe ten thousand different versions of the um, internal variability and also the hydrologic modeling uncertainty. And you only get an acceptable performance if you pass a high percentage, I think we use 75 percent of all of those different scenarios. So um, I, have, I, I would say I have confidence in it, some confidence, but that's explicitly how we came up with whether it's acceptable or not. That's a good question. Yep. Rachel. Um, so I mean, this study I was a little bit a part of, so I know that there's definitely some um, idealization, I guess, associated with this. And in the academic world, you can play around with these numbers. You can take that internal variability turn knob and play around with it. But since you have a lot more experience working with actual stakeholders and people who really want to use this kind of information for decision making, how much play do you as a water resource expert have in going to the historical record or going to the proxy record or playing with that knob and how much is it like how much resistance is there to kind of playing with those un unknown unknowns, I guess? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so that's right. So for another water utility, um, which I won't name their names, but they're located, they're very large and located in um, Colorado, and they're not Denver. Lorna just left. Um, that question came up because we had the same thing. We had many, many scenarios uh, that we wanted to run uh, through different versions of internal climate variability, and they wanted to look at them and hand pick what those traces were. Because they were afraid if we had some crazy traces in there, that they were going to have to respond to them. It was going to be extremely costly to actually respond to them. So we, you know, we what we ended up doing, we generated 10,000 traces and essentially handpicked 10 from those that they felt were that tested their systems in reasonable ways, but that weren't too ridiculous, essentially. So yeah, that was a case where um, uh, it was very much back and forth. And, and, and we said, well, you really want to make sure you, you capture the full range. They said, well, yes, but we don't want anything cr too crazy. And yeah, it was really back and forth process. Um, another case, I, I don't think, well, we'll see if I talk about it if we have time. Um, this International Open Great Lakes study, there people are interested, one person in particular wanted us to, to generate new scenarios that hadn't been seen just, and, and that we couldn't reproduce um, statistically. So if we use our statistical approaches to generate a bunch of variability, we get some extremes. He wanted to just generate new things. I mean, just, you know, change the numbers, not do it any sort of uh, scientific way. And there was a lot of pushback against that. I thought, yeah, sure, let's do it. Let's see uh, what happens. We'll never be able to say much about whether it's likely to occur or not, but you'll just know if you get 10 years in a row of below average inflows that, yeah, you're in big trouble. He said, he, he described it as, things I do late at night in my basement to like create these new time series that break all the <laughs> stochastic rules. Yeah. yeah. Question, yes. Yeah. So I guess it's actually a bit related to what you're just saying. If you could go back to... Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's quite obvious that you need to understand the vulnerabilities of your system, whatever system you, you're dealing with. But I can't really see how that makes it easier to assign probabilities to the changes that you find that are problematic for your system. So in a way, I struggle to see how this actually changes anything in terms of the current way of doing it. Yeah, it's a, it's a couple of interesting aspects of that question. I wouldn't say it makes it easier to assign probabilities to this full space, for example. I might say that the stakes of assigning probabilities to parts of that space are lower. And, I'll, and I'll, I'll show you, I will go forward and, and show you an example. But first, the, um, but there's another part of your question. You know, what makes this different? For example, if you were to just run through all the uh, GCM projections, is that what your, your question is saying? 
I think if you do it the, non, the usual way, and I'm not saying I agree with it because I don't, but in the end, the, <laughs> the, the, the end user will still look at their own system and try to assess their vulnerabilities and then get the information also that you are giving them, or at least sometimes that's how it Yes, is. yeah, yeah. So, um, okay, so different levels of that. One is that um, what we're trying to do is make sure that we fully explore the, the possible impacts, the possible vulnerabilities. And I think that in a, in a GCM-led approach, it's, you're not guaranteed to do that. I think you're actually likely to not get the full range of what might actually happen. Because it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's sort of a um, sampling of opportunity, which you happen to see in your system. And when you do have a particular run through your system, you know, what is driving the vulnerability that you saw? You know, what's associated with it? You don't learn uh, the particular characteristics of climate that your system is vulnerable to. So I think, I think that's sort of the big advantage uh, uh, of what we're trying to do here. Um, yeah, the, the other question, I guess, what the stakeholder takes from it. You know, I think assigning probabilities is extremely important. I think that they're, at the end of the day, going to want to know whether they have to worry about these things or not, right? And I don't know how we can do that better um, than giving them some sense of the information that's available. I think we have to think very carefully about how we generate those probabilities. Um, and I, and I, I, I think that the work we did initially on this was naive in that approach. You know, sort of, we were young, we needed the money again. Um, and, but I think that it's important that we, you know, when you do assign probability density functions, you assign them to the full space. It's not just the dots that, that a typical analysis is. We can question that the way we do it right now, we assign essentially uniform distribution to everything, right? But at least we're willing to uh, um, accept that everything's possible, or at least a very, very wide range is possible. And I think that's. I think that part is important. But let me show you what I mean uh, about the stakes, how we might change the stakes. Or l l I can do that. Is there any, any, any other questions before I go forward with that? Yeah. About the, the diagram as well. Yeah. This is my, I hate these colors. Everyone comes back to them. I'll never show this again. It's just so <laughs> ugly. <laughs> um, I guess I'm a little bit confused because you said previously in your talk that we should be looking at variability mm -hmm. yeah monthly and annual or whatever and you've got here that you're, you're basically looking at I'm assuming anyway at changes in annual or winter or whatever it is um, precipitation and you said previously that um, the 70% say um, of historic average would be looking at a drought type scenario, whereas the 130% would be looking at more flooding. And I don't really see why those two things have to be mutually exclusive. I mean, in, in fact, we might expect that um, we get more droughts in the future, but we also get more floods. So how does this type of approach account for that type of variability? Is that accounted for within this? Yes, yeah, yeah. I'll show you. I'll go to the next example. I'll show you where we explicitly put things in terms of variability. I think we need to do more of that. Um, putting things in terms of precipitation, temperature change is consistent with what people have expected to see a lot of the time. So, you know, we're working with this water utility. That's what they want to see. Um, and, and so that's where we are. But I'll show you one. I like the variability plots because they look uh, cool. So let me just go through this really quickly. If people are okay with questions, I'll, I'll try to drive through. So this is International Upper Great Lakes study. We're looking at the Great Lakes. They're big, largest water resources system in the world, is what people say. Uh, we were dealing with the multiple uh, stakeholder groups representing different objectives, ecosystem, navigation, recreation, hydroelectricity, production, coastal real estate. Um, the lakes go up and down, and that makes people unhappy. Uh, so we have highs, 70s, 90s, lows, 20s, 30s, 60s. There are impacts associated with high lake levels, impacts associated with low lake levels. And recently that they have completed the International Joint Commission is the binational group that manages the lakes or oversees the management of lakes. And they completed a $20 million study on Lake Ontario St. Lawrence River study, the conclusions of which have still not been implemented. They're still fighting over them. I, I don't know how many years it's been, at least uh, maybe it's been 10 years now. 
and the and then I was lucky enough to be involved in the international Upper Great Lakes study. So that the Upper Great Lakes are everything north north upstream of Niagara Falls, as it turns out. So Great Lakes are in the news because they are well, they were low. Um, Economically, per economically perilous low levels, et cetera, et cetera. A uh, retired Army Corps expert tells the Bay City crowd that climate change is the cause. So it's settled. Um, and they're still low, as it turns out. So here's the system. I'll try to go through this quickly. But there's a lot of uh, vertical fluxes in the system. And the horizontal fluxes are relatively small, so we don't have much we can really manage here. We manage, what we can do is manage the flows. The only place we really have control are the flows between Lake Superior and uh, Lakes Michigan Huron, which are hydrologically connected, hydraulically connected as one lake. Um, one of the big questions, or a question was, should we put in more controls? Build new structures so that we could better control the, the lakes. This is a good engineering approach. And these are where we do have some controls, the locks at Sault Ste. Marie. We have hydroelectricity production and navigation is important as well. So that's where things go through. If you look at recent history uh, of the lakes, you can sort of, this is like Alice's Restaurant. You can get whatever you want. So if you look, use a long record, there's no change, no trends. If you use a shorter, more recent record, then you can find some trends, up or down whichever you want. There's another close-up of Sault Ste. Marie, the con only control we have in this massive system. Um, here are lake levels for Lake Superior. And the historic range is about 1.2 meters. Now, someone who grew up in coastal New England, I thought to myself, 1.2 meters? You guys can't handle changes of 1.2 meters or more? You know, we have 20 feet of change every day, 12 hours. It happens twice. Um, but this is what they're adapted to, so this is where we need to keep things more or less. They made a major investment in climate change projections, and this is also a little bit like Alice's Restaurant. You can get whatever you want. You can get projections saying that things are going to get wetter or drier. So Livy mentioned net basin supply. This is net inflows to the lakes, and these are the percent changes in those. So a large multi-model ensemble. Um, the problem we're had was select a lake regulation plan that satisfies multiple stakeholder objectives for the next 30 years or so. That was a planning period that we used. The challenges that we faced, the system was not well understood. I, I was shocked coming into this is how little we know about precipitation over the lakes. Apparently there, there are no rain gauges in the middle of the lakes. Um, there was a multi-million dollar investment, our investment, in climate science, which yielded greater uncertainty. We could not narrow the range. Uh, the future is highly uncertain. We have multiple competing objectives. We've got stakeholders. So we had a board that was going to ultimately make this decision, political appointments. And some, <laughs> some people characterized some as true believers, whatever the climate model said. Or no, it wasn't that. The lakes are going down because of climate change. We have to prepare for that. And others who did not believe climate change was happening, all within the same group. And again, a decision that's a, sort of a long-term decision. So our response was to try to put things in terms of uncertainty. So the first thing we did was list all the unc unks. Oh, that was supposed to be blank. What will people care about in 20 years? Oh, then we listed it, and it became a conk. Uh, so we want to define the performance in commensurate stakeholder-defined terms. How can we address this fact that we don't really have anything that can we can add up in any sort of a logical way in terms of impacts? Um, decompose the risk into system responses and climate assumptions. Accommodate all plausible scenarios. We didn't want to rule out any future. Um, and this idea of plausibility was also important because probability was such a loaded word. Have people run into that before where you can't use the term probability because it applies that we know exactly what those probabilities are? This is, was the problem. So we made up this, we didn't make it up, but we started using the term plausibility. It's probability in uh, code. <laughs> And skunks, these are the real stinkers. We only partially understand the lake system. We really can't explain why it goes up and down. This is a problematic situation to try to predict the future. And so we adopted the attitude that we're going to be wrong, that the correct answer will only be known in retrospect. So let's design our system to perform well when we're wrong. 
what we did do is try to uh, define things in terms uh, the stakeholders defined. They told us what the risks were. We asked them, we said, let's try to come up with a commensurate measure that, that affects everyone. So forget about economics or anything else. Define for us acceptable lake levels. What are the lake levels that are all right? And what are the lake levels that are problematic? And so this is just an example. We came up with this idea of coastal or uh, coping zones. This is the example from the coastal group where we have uh, zone C. If things go beyond zone C, this is catastrophe, can't handle it. Zone B, things are bad. And in between those, zone A, everything's fine. For each of the groups, they define these different levels for each of the lakes. I'm just going through this quickly because I wanted to show this graph which is variability, which is the question of variability. So here we have mean change in net basin supply. So think wetter or drier. And then this is, this, in this case, we uh, parameterized it as standard deviation. So this is the variability in the net basin supply. So this is more variable and less variable. variable. And this is the performance of a particular regulation plan. So here's one of our candidate plans. How good does it do? We measured it in terms of how much it could keep you within your coping zones. Things are OK. This is the range of climate change over which this particular plan could keep us in, or out of, I'm sorry, out of zone C, um, all except one time, one, the number of historical occurrences. So we're good to go. This is the range that this plan can handle. It can handle a mean change from, say, a reduction of 15% net basin supply up to an increase of about 5%. And it can handle a variability increase, in deviation in this case, of, I don't know, about 18% or so. Variability decreasing, not a big deal. It, things, that's why things get wider. More variability makes things more difficult. If you increase things further, this is if I can handle double the number of historical times I went into zone C. So we try to put it in, in terms that people can understand. How often did the lakes exceed the levels that you like? This plan, it'll only happen once under these conditions. It'll happen double the times this had happened historically under those conditions. That's how we tried to define how well the plans would operate in stakeholder terms without saying anything about what will happen in terms of probability yet. Just w what are the limits of each of these plans? You can do that for every plan. It's very exciting. You can then um, do something which I thought was kind of neat. We had this problem that some stakeholders believed in climate change and some stakeholders would not accept us judging plans based on climate change. What do we do about that? Well, we can go back to those the range of each of those plans, and we could assign probabilities based on our climate change projections, or we could assign probabilities based on stationarity, and we could rank them in both of those directions. And so what happened was sort of interesting. These are each of the candidate plans. Well, we found that it didn't matter. So we were potentially going to have this big argument of whether do we use climate change projections or not. By weighting them and ranking them, we just saw that, well, actually, the, it doesn't change the ordering. So we don't have to argue over climate change or not. It doesn't affect the decision, as it turns out. OK, and um, there's this question of residual risk. So this is another version of a plan. If I then superimpose on the same axes project, or let's say projections from different sources, historic, stochastic, paleo, statistical, RCMs, of the changes, then what I can show is for each of these, for this particular plan, so they called it plan 2013. So this is the, the winning plan. This is what's left over. This is the residual risk that we face and from all these different sources. So here's the uh, low levels on Michigan Huron and high levels on Michigan Huron. So let's just focus on this. This is low, Michigan Huron getting too low. And this is the probability of that from each of these different sources. This is probability, or this is Michigan Huron getting too high. And this is the probability from each of those different sources. So just a range of probabilities. What this points us to is maybe these in general have very different estimates of what the probability is, but they point us all in the same direction is that we should probably be thinking about low levels on Michigan here and what are the impacts and mitigating those impacts. It's just a prioritization. I'm not saying I can't tell you exactly what the probabilities are, but I can certainly prioritize thinking about low levels on Michigan here on and as it turns out high levels on Lake Superior. So that's, I'm not sure, so that's the, the idea in which it makes it slightly easier. The stakes are lower in terms of getting those probabilities exactly right. All right, yes? 
Oh. I just have a question about interpreting that graph. It's interesting to me, if you look at the, the bar for um, low levels on the far left, that the GCM assigns the highest probability of that happening, and then the RCM, which would presumably be forced by the GCM, is at the opposite end. And then you look at the high lake levels and the opposite, then they're right next to each other. Do you, do you have an idea of like physically kind of what was driving that? or? What we learned from this, uh, one of the most interesting we learned for this is we wish we had waited to do the uh, to do the whole modeling analysis until after we learned what the consequences were, because those sorts of questions came up all the time. So, for example, what it turned out is that people are really interested in this idea that the lakes return to some sort of equilibrium state, and that the GCMs wouldn't get that because they don't represent them, but an RCM would potentially get that. So, what would have been really interesting is to drive the RCM with one of the GCMs that was very, very dry, for example, or very, very wet, and see if the internal dynamics would drive it to an equilibrium. But the RCM runs had been done previously by the model that was available, and they happened to pick models that were very close to the mean. So that the, the, what's also underneath this, and again, this is these are very rough probabilities. I, I wouldn't uh, sort of hang my hat on how we did this, did this at all. But um, the RCMs are about three total runs, between three and five total runs, I think is the number. The GCM projections are over a hundred runs. So they're very, they're, they're, they're not really comparable in that sort of sense in figuring out why one is going up and why one's going down. But yeah, th that was a great message for us is that there were so many questions that were raised after we had done a lot of sort of the impact analysis and the vulnerability analysis, but it came after. It would have been nice it had come before. Yes, Rob. Thank you. Based on all of the varied studies that you've undertaken in the US and around the world, are you able to distill down to just a, a small number of, of physical insights you really wish you could get from the climate modeling community? So if there was a on your wish list two or three things that climate modelers could improve to make your job as an engineer simpler or more enriching, uh, more insightful. What what would you, what would be on your shopping list? What physical process or insight would you like to have more information on that you don't have now, or you would like to be able to use the climate information in a smarter, deeper way than you can now? That's a good question. I guess the um, what gives me pause is is trying to overlap that with. Um, what's achievable, I guess, in the, in the time frame I'd be able to use it. Um, certainly, I, I like this idea. I don't know how um, plausible it is that we'll get results anytime soon, but I like the idea of the Cato uh, scale predictions that in many of our um, projects, and if maybe it's controversial to use discount rates, but we typically do use discount rates in a lot of development projects in particular, the short term really matters a lot. And it's um, dominated by internal variability right now. And that's that's a lot of variability to live with. So if there was a way to get information there, I think that'd be a useful thing. You know, I think extremes are, are the big challenge, right? So what can we say about um, variability in the future? What can we say about uh, flood risk in the future? I think are the other big challenges that would stand out to me. Yeah. So one thing that I've seen done a lot when uh, climate scientists are trying to um, encourage communities or whatever to, to think about using climate change data is they'll show historical data and show the graph and show the trend and demonstrate that sort of, in a way, stationary is dead because it never existed. Like over the course of the last hundred years, you've constantly had to be adjusting to new conditions. Do you think that that's problematic in that it sort of introduces the idea that that change will stay the same, the rate of change will stay the same? Because in the last 100 years, it typically looks linear. Uh, in your own experience, do you think that's problematic? That, um, that we're encouraging sort of linear extrapolations of the trends that we've seen historically? Is that the idea? Yeah. It's, it's normally 
I mean, I think it's effective as a means for getting people to think outside of the box a little bit. But I, I worry that without the additional follow-up, they might be getting the wrong impression. Um, it's an interesting question. I think in this case where we're working on right now, we were, um, which is uh, um, water from the upper Colorado Basin, and we looked at temperature trends. We're trying to sort of do our usual thing, usual thing, and we're trying to choose a baseline. How do we choose the baseline when there's this strong, strong tend in te trend in temperature in the upper Colorado Basin? It became sort of this problematic issue because any baseline we chose, if, it was just an interesting question. And we went back, we had gone back 50 years, that was when the data we were using started and had this very strong trend. We were amazed by how strong the trend was. And we thought, wow, for the guy who wants us to do the cooling scenarios, because there is someone who wants us to do cooling scenarios, we're going to show him this trend, you know. Uh, and then for some other reason, we just did this. We went back 100 years with the data. We did that, and suddenly this trend was this bowl sort of a shape. And it was, there was still a trend there, certainly, but it wasn't nearly. It was warmer previously, and it cooled. And we see that a lot. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, I, in, the, in the Great Lakes, for example, another good example, um, the study was done. Our study was updating Plan 77B, it was called, which was a study that was done in the early 70s in response to lake levels. And when the study started, I'm going to get this wrong, they were, the lakes were either too low or too high. Let's say the lakes were too low. And so we had to do a new study because the regulation plan is not working. Lake levels are too low. By the end of the study, lake levels were too high. And they were adjusting the plan to deal with lake levels that were too high. And, and this is the way that it, it's sort of always been on the Great Lakes. And, and so this idea of extrapolation, it seemed this time was different. But this time was different because lake levels are going low and climate change is occurring. And so this time we can count on lake levels being low. And there's actually this big um, debate about whether in our public statement we would say, what would we say? You know, we just spent all this money on climate change analysis of the Great Lakes. We have to have an answer. You know, we were trying to float the idea that we would say, um, the future is difficult to anticipate. This is sort of our, you know, we don't understand the system all that well, and the future is difficult to, to anticipate. Didn't fly. We had to have an answer. So the answer was, um, we expect lake levels to be slightly lower in the future and increased variability. We have no evidence of increased variability at all, actually. They said that because the range was very wide in the projections. I guess that's associated with increased variability. And the mean of those projections, which maybe has meaning, I, I don't know that does or not, is a little less than average, long-term average. Um, so I guess in those studies, it was just so strong to me that we, can't, we just have to say we don't know. That I guess, uh, yeah, I think it's all, it can be certainly problematic to try to use trends when we th know that so many of these trends can be expressions of low frequency variability. Now, I think that's, an, a, that's a regional and smaller scale question. I don't, I, I'm much more comfortable on certainly a, the larger scale situation. But we know the internal variability is so important on these regional scales and the scales of our systems that, that I agree, it can be, it can be problematic to, to use a trend and, and implicitly imply that we can expect more of the same. Um, can I just point those orders? Are you finished with presenting? I don't I, I can give a summary slide. Do you want me to get to, I can give a, I yeah. that okay. And then we'll just do a full discussion. Okay. I think it's. Is it no? Yeah, uh, I'll. We we did some. We ultimately came up with an adaptive management plan for our regulation plan, which is very good. Can ask me about that later. So here's the conclusion: successfully managing water resources amid climate variability and change will be a great challenge of the century. I think that's true. That's uh, job security for those of you working in the water sector. There's still chance for you who are thinking about changing. Um, inherent and irreducible uncertainties of the climate system. Better understanding can result in greater uncertainty. It requires a shift in emphasis from reducing uncertainty to framing and managing uncertainty. I would say eliciting stakeholder definitions of risk is challenging. You know, one thing we want to do, let's put it in the stakeholder terms. It turns out stakeholders are busy. They've got more pressing things to do. Um, you're, you're, you've got this complicated thing you, they want you to do, we want them to do. Uh, decision and center approaches, I think, are nascent. And there's lots of technical opportunity, um, but I think they're promising. And don't be a sacred scholar. Don't behind, hide behind your 
uh, Vatican walls, let's say. Okay, that's my summary. Good. And then was is there a question or a question? Yes. Now we're yep. in the question period, as if we weren't already in the question period. So do we want to thank him with applause? Yes, thank you. Yes, 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 yes.